it to disrupt everybody's commute. So, uh, How's your commute? Mine's, mine couldn't be easier. I can over. Good morning. I, I think we'll get started today so we stay on track. I appreciate everyone coming bright and early this morning for our breakfast keynote. Uh, my name is Tracy Ford and I'm the director of the DAS Forum. Uh, today's focus is going to be outdoor, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the problems and, and opportunities working at the federal, state, and local levels, and we're also going to focus on uh, how small cells are evolving. We've got two panels on that. One will talk on small cells. I think there's some confusion in the industry about what constitutes a small cell. And then we're going to talk about the evolution of DAS as well. Um, you know, what we see on the next three to five years. I, I found it interesting in one of yesterday's panels that um, uh, almost everybody on stage said you can only plan about two years out because the technology is changing so quickly. So uh, lots of opportunity, but probably some uh, areas that might be a little frustrating too as you try to plan uh, uh, your, your networks going forward. Um, a couple housekeeping items. Uh, the Wi-Fi access code, if you can get on, is 077-BAB, and BAB is uppercase. Um, and again, don't everyone get on at once, because it's not going to work. I understand they're getting a new DAS here, and uh, if we come back next year, maybe everything will be fine. <laughs> uh, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsors, our premier sponsor, TE Connectivity, our gold sponsor, Comscope. Last night's uh, aquarium tour was uh, sponsored by Aragal and transportation was provided by Harris Communications. Um, our session sponsor yesterday was IB Wave, and our session sponsor today is Power Wave. Um, in addition, I want to thank uh, AT&T for the tour we'll be conducting this afternoon of Turner Field. Um, I, I, as I understand it, Turner Field is one of the premier baseball stadiums in the US, so we'll take a look at that and see if it's true, and see how their new DAS works. Uh, today's keynote breakfast is called Rules, Reg Regulations, and Roadblocks, and it is my pleasure to introduce my boss, Mike Fitch. Mike is President and CEO of PCIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association, and he'll update you on uh, legislative efforts that have taken place that PCIA has been part of in the last year. So please join me in welcoming Mike Fitch. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you all uh, for attending here. Uh, it's a great turnout, and uh, today is going to be a, a, a great day, as was yesterday. So I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, the many distinguished speakers that we have on panels today, as well as the, the tour this afternoon. Uh, well, as, as you know, PCIA and the DAS Forum uh, spend a lot of time and energy on advocacy for the industry. That's really the keynote of any industry association. Uh, 2011 and early 2012 have been really hallmark years uh, in terms of accomplishments. Uh, those have been more general than, uh, those have been both general as to all siting and specific as to uh, DAS issues. Uh, and on both fronts there's been uh, tremendous progress over the last year and a half, let's say. Uh, really, it goes back further than that in terms of, of creating the groundwork. Uh, those of you who do work uh, in the regulatory area know how slowly the regulatory and legislative wheels grind. Uh, they go backwards as well as forwards, sometimes much to uh, everybody's dismay. But uh, over, the last, over the last year plus, we've had really important forward progress in a number of areas. Um, our panels will get into more of the details on that, uh, but we're all happy to, to talk to you if you have any questions or if you want more information about any of the uh, different things that have occurred over the last, uh, over the last year plus. Um, by way of introduction, uh, at the risk of, of stating the obvious, uh, clearly, we're all aware of the huge increases in mobile data use and the demands that they are putting on wireless systems. Uh, that makes DAS and small cells all the more significant and all the more important and all the more mainstream to the wireless networks. Uh, it's, it's easy to recall 
uh, not that long ago uh, when the DAS Forum was created and in the early years of the DAS Forum when DAS was highly special, was regarded as highly specialized, complex, uh, you know, maybe the carriers and the big companies wanted to go there and maybe they didn't. Uh, in some cases they definitely didn't originally. All that has clearly changed and DAS is mainstream, uh, ultra mainstream. Uh, we see it in the attendance here at the, at the conference, we see it uh, every year now at our annual show where DAS and small cells are an increasingly important part of the program and an increasingly important part of the, the draw of the issues that bring people together at the show uh, to get better informed about what's going on in the industry. The big ticket acquisitions that have gone on as soon as you start to see the B billion uh, assigned to acquisitions that gets the interest of the financial community as well it should and I understand that uh, the last uh, the last of those just closed yesterday and we'll hear more about that I'm sure uh, from our our panel as well uh, the big regulatory activity on macro siting uh, over the last year was the legislation that was included in the Payroll Tax Extension Act that was adopted at the end of February that essentially adopts co-location by right for uh, siting in the United States. That's federal legislation that preempts state and local regs. Uh, from our standpoint, a huge breakthrough and something that we've been working on for a long, long time. Uh, we're thrilled at that result. I think that result will also affect uh, DAS, although the legislation is very general, it does not speak specifically to DAS, it speaks specifically to towers, but I think it's a huge opening of the door and we'll continue to work on that to broaden its uh, applicability uh, in any way that we can. On the DAS specific issue front, Last year, the FCC issued its rulings on pole attachments. Those were very favorable towards the communications industry and your interests. Uh, needless to say, the relatively deep pockets of the utility companies have uh, funded all sorts of appeals and all sorts of uh, further litigation on pole attachments, which is ongoing. Uh, but uh, I think the FCC has a very firm basis, uh, firm and sound basis for the decisions that it made. I fully expect these to be upheld by the courts ultimately. Uh, the FCC acted relatively quickly to turn down reconsideration requests by the uh, utility industry. Uh, and since the rules are in effect, uh, notwithstanding the appeals, uh, we hear from you that there's already been improvements in the responsiveness of the utility companies. So that's a lot of that's a very important issue. Again, a long time coming. That that proceeding uh, went on seemingly forever at the FCC, as as big complex proceedings tend to do. Uh, but the result was very favorable. It's, uh, I think, will be sustained on appeal and ultimately, again, a, a huge win for the telecommunications and the DAS industry specifically. Uh, of course, there are still hurdles. There are still problems. There are still challenges. And you and we continue to try to address those uh, on behalf of the industry and ultimately on behalf of the users and the public that benefit from these systems. Uh, a couple of issues that I know uh, our panel is going to touch on. Uh, Section 106, Historic Preservation Re Review. Our position is that DAS should be exempt from that process. Uh, that, that the impact of DAS is so minimal that there's no need for the, the normal NEPA, environmental, tribal, et cetera, et cetera, sort of process that was really put in place to deal with macro sites. Uh, it's really, it, the intention was to deal with a completely different category of installations 
uh, it's been applied or misapplied as the case may be in some situations to DAS and small cells. Uh, really there's no logic to that. You step back and, and look at what the what the underlying purpose of the regulations was supposed to be, and that's something that we continue to pursue on the legal front. Uh, there are still plenty of problems at the local level uh, as they discover uh, DAS, uh, and again, they were a little bit slow on the uptake, and uh, while initially I think uh, in many cases DAS was seen as the the easier alternative from the government standpoint to macro sites, uh, now nothing's an easy alternative, uh, even though it should be. And so, uh, again, in some cases we see misapplication of local regulation that was drafted to deal with macro sites to small cells and DAS. Uh, in other cases, it's really a deliberate effort to Overregulate DAS as a revenue source, uh, which is certainly a sore subject uh, for most local governments, uh, and uh, that's unfortunate, but shouldn't be our problem. Uh, and uh, in other cases, it's just a lack of a, a real lack of understanding as to how the role that DAS and small cells play in the wireless network, and therefore what regulatory approach makes sense at the local level. So plenty of challenges there to deal with. There are also some opportunities that uh, were included in the siting legislation at the federal level. Uh, there's a, a, a couple of sections on, uh, there's the general section on siting, there's also a specific section on master contracts on federal properties, and that's an issue that we're, we PCIA and the DAS Forum are very active on as well as uh, I think it's GSA looks to implement and add details to the, the general provisions that are in the legislation. So a lot, a lot to cover, a lot of, a lot of activity, a lot of issues, uh, both challenges and opportunities. We have a terrific panel to start off this morning and, and follow on panels as the day goes on to talk about these issues and bring you up to speed answer questions that you may have. And with that, I will introduce the moderator of this first panel, Zach Champ. Zach is Government Affairs Counsel at PCIA and is our DAS legal specialist. And Zach will in turn introduce the panelists this morning. So thank you very much. Welcome. Enjoy this second day. We're glad you're all here. Well, thank you for, for being here bright and early uh, this morning. Um, I think we have a great panel here. Um, as we learned from the tour, uh, a tank can only uh, contain so many whale sharks, and, and this panel has a couple of great uh, specimens up here. Um, a, as Mike alluded to, this, this panel um, will take a deeper dive into some of the rules and regulations that are affecting uh, the rollout of DAS at the state and local level. Um, so we're, we're going to have uh, some conversations there. Um, let, me, let me start off by uh, introducing the panel. To my immediate left, your right, um, is Douglas Dimitrov. Uh, he's partner at Philips Lytle. Um, and as a partner, he is the leader of the firm's telecommunications group. Um, also, uh, he he's, plays a major role in the firm's appearances before the zoning, planning, uh, and planning boards before more than uh, half of all municipalities in the state of New York. Um, an avid Bills fan, uh, he is also a member of and founder um, and president of the New York State Wireless Association. Um, PCIA uh, works pretty closely with these uh, state wireless associations. It's, it's a way that our industry can learn um, what's happening at the local level. And thank you for your continued work there. Um, to, to Doug's left is Christopher Sinclair of uh, NextG Networks Inc. slash Crown Castle as of uh, noon yesterday. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, Christopher has been involved in managing network uh, real estate and government relations for, for wireless and wireline providers, uh, focused on the deployment of telecommunications in the public right of way since 1996. Um, prior to uh, Christopher's affiliation with NextG and Crown Castle, uh, he's worked with CSX Fiber Networks, uh, On Fiber Communications, and Metrocom Inc. Um, Mr. Sinclair has uh, 
received his, uh, his uh, Bachelor of Science from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, so I think, I think we have a great panel here where we can talk uh, about uh, the legal implications uh, of how we can roll out DAS as well as how we use the tools um, that we have um, at the local level. So with that, I think uh, I'll, I'll throw it over to Doug to, to give a little bit of a presentation and follow on from Mike's opening statements um, regarding the, uh, the master contracts and some other items. Okay. Doug? Thank you, Zach. And just to clarify, did you call me a whale shark? Is that what you're suggesting? Anyway. Maybe so. Maybe so. Anyway. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to highlight several uh, laws at the federal level uh, that affect or may affect small cell and DAS deployment. Uh, and in particular, um, all of these provisions are actually part of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, uh, also known as the 2012 Act that includes all sorts of stuff we wanted to bury in a tax act. Um, but in reality, uh, there is a connection in, uh, to wireless and wireless siting uh, to tax relief. And that connection is as follows. Uh, in order to pay for uh, tax relief, uh, the government, Congress, decided that they needed to do some things to raise money. And one of the ways to do that is to auction wireless spectrum. And uh, to Congress's credit, uh, Washington works in, in, in sometimes mysterious ways, but sometimes very effective ways. Uh, they realize that if uh, companies are going to spend billions of dollars, uh, theoretically, to buy Spectrum, uh, which is desperately needed, as we've heard yesterday and, and for many, many months, um, they've got to be able to deploy it. Companies need to be able to deploy that Spectrum. So in order to do that, Congress came up with a number of ways uh, in which to um, uh, make deployment of wireless, and in particular, uh, I think DAS as well, and small cells, uh, easier. So. The first of these provisions relates to modifications of the wireless facilities, and it's found in 6409A. Uh, some of you may have been on some panels, or rather, uh, some webinars, participated in webinars, uh, put on by PCIA and others, uh, where there's, uh, that particular provision or set of provisions has been described. Um, so I'll just go through it briefly uh, to give you a handle on, on at least my perspective uh, in terms of how it may apply. And, and Mike Fitch alluded to it earlier. Uh, but under this section, a state or local government cannot deny and must approve what is termed an eligible facilities request or, uh, uh, or of a modification of an existing tower or base station that does not substantially change the physical dimensions of the tower or base station. Uh, a lot of words, but it's actually very short and sweet. Um, the problem with it is uh, it's a little too short and sweet from our perspective, from, a, for example, a lawyer's perspective. Um, there is one definition, and that's an eligible facilities request, uh, and that is essentially any request to modify an existing wireless tower or base station that involves one of three things, co-location of transmission equipment, removal of transmission equipment, or replacement of such equipment. Uh, there's really no legislative history to speak of, uh, and very little guidance, as I said, in terms of uh, other definitions. Uh, there have been, however, uh, uh, plenty of uh, commentators, uh, for example, municipal consultants across the country, who suggest that that provision should be very narrowly construed. So, for example, the definition of tower and the definition of base station should be very narrowly uh, construed. For example, tower should mean nothing more than a monopole or um, lattice tower, guide tower, the traditional communications type towers. Um, and as a result, should uh, only be applied, this provision should only be applied in very limited circumstances. Um, I think in those cases where commentators have looked for, or, uh, have suggested a very narrow interpretation, um, if followed by local and state governments, the industry is going to be forced to litigate um, on, those, on those definitions. Um, and, uh, and that may happen you know, sooner rather than later. Uh, particularly given uh, the need to continue to build out, uh, build out facilities. Um, it, does it apply to, to DAS? I think uh, we heard Mike say that perhaps not on its face. Um, I think there are circumstances that more or less on their face uh, would apply uh, in terms of outdoor DAS. Um, but again, uh, it'll be, it'll, there'll be some trickiness and there will be some back and forth, let me put it that way, uh, with respect to local authorities and state authorities. Um, 
Another provision that I want to reference is, uh, again, under the Tax Act, uh, that will affect small cell deployment. And again, Mike referred to it. Um, actually, I'm going to switch gears. I'll, I'll, uh, let me mention another one that very few people have referenced, uh, in my experience, the last couple of months. But it's a, it's a provision, a uh, short provision relating to rights of way and easements. And this is under 6409B, and it mandates that the administrator of the General Services Administration of the GSA develop a standard form of application for easements and rights of way on federal property to be used for installation, construction, or maintenance of wireless uh, uh, facilities, uh, structures, equipment, as well as backhaul transmission equipment. Um, for any of you who have dealt with the federal government or various federal government agencies, it can be a nightmare. Um, there, there's often delays. There are different approaches uh, depending on the agency you're dealing with. And so this provision of the Tax Act, 6409B, uh, requires the GSA to develop a standard application form for easements and rights of way. Uh, so we can look, at, look for that, hopefully in the near future. The fees for granting the easements and rights of way, there's a little bit uh, of, uh, of direction, if you will, in this provision. Um, it must be based on direct cost recovery unless the administrator of the GSA establishes exceptions in consideration of the public benefit uh, and in the interest of expanding wireless and broadband coverage. So that language suggests to me that, uh, that in fact, the GSA administrator, when he's developing a, a, a pricing for an easement or right of way, um, has the ability to uh, actually lower what would otherwise be the direct cost recovery for the federal agency involved, uh, which is a good sign. Uh, the third provision, which I started to mention before, which Michael had referred to as well in his remarks, is the master contracts for wireless facilities provisions. And this is under 6409C. And pursuant to that provision, the administrator of the GSA has until April 23rd, uh, which is just a couple of weeks away, to develop one or more master contracts that will govern the placement of wireless service antenna structures on buildings and other property owned by the federal government. And in developing this contract or contracts, uh, the administrator must standardize the treatment of the placement of these facilities on buildings, including rooftops or inside buildings. Uh, the technology used in connection with the structures must also be standardized, which I think is a bit of a problem from, from our perspective. Not sure exactly what there means, that means. There's really no guidance in the, in the law in terms of what that means, but hopefully it doesn't mean that uh, the, the federal government will dictate the type of technology that will be used uh, in any particular uh, federal property setting. Um, and uh, other issues, the administrator has the authority to, uh, to develop, or as he deems appropriate, um, can include in these master forms. Now, the master contracts will apply to all publicly accessible buildings and other property owned by the federal government. So it's not just buildings, but it's land, for example. Plenty of federal land, as we know. Um, but the administrator has the ability to decide that siting of an antenna structures on specific buildings or other properties uh, could warrant non-standard treatment. Um, I suspect that means uh, high security or other sensitive properties may be treated differently. Uh, but essentially, this provision dictates that the GSA develop a master form and really promotes the use of federal buildings and properties for uh, wireless facilities. Uh, uh, our office has been involved the last several weeks, a month and a half now actually, uh, uh, working uh, with the G staff at the GSA to uh, help determine what their plan is. And uh, what we understand is that they are going to adopt in all likelihood by the deadline, which is again April 23rd, uh, as the standard form, a single standard form, an existing GSA form that some of you may have come across. It's entitled the U.S. Government Lease for Real Property Communications Space. That form actually has provisions relating to DAS in it, um, uh, which, you know, are helpful, um, not entirely workable. And uh, my own personal uh, opinion is that the uh, GSA ought to develop uh, different forms depending on the, the setting or the type of uh, installation but we'll see how, uh, how that unfolds. Uh, and then uh, staff indi has indicated to us that the, the likely plan is after the adoption or the, uh, the formal acknowledgement that the current form is the standard for now, they'll continue to look at uh, updating and creating perhaps um, other forms based on, on that existing form. 
Uh, PCIA, as Mike said, and CTIA and others um, are in the process now of developing and submitting comments to the administrator of the, GN, the GSA in connection uh, with uh, the, their, uh, their current form. Um, and it's hoped, frankly, that the industry, through these comments, is going to uh, help the administrator uh, create something that's much more workable and uh, market-oriented uh, than what currently um, we face in many cases with federal properties. Um, the, uh, the last item in the Tax Act that I wanted to mention is um, the establishment of a first responder network authority called FirstNet, uh, which will use the 700 megahertz D-block uh, spectrum and existing public safety spectrum uh, to create a nationwide interoperable public safety broadband network. Uh, it will be based on, and this is all set forth in the statute, uh, a single national network architecture. Um, there is, uh, that's an aggressive uh, approach. Uh, we've heard about it before. Uh, there's been some attempts at the state level uh, in various states. Uh, but this is, uh, again, uh, part of the, the Tax Act of 2012. I think a very significant um, opportunity, uh, frankly, for this industry and the wireless industry uh, broadly. Um, FirstNet, uh, as, as it's referred to, um, is obligated to take all necessary action to ensure deployment and operation of that nationwide network on a fairly fast, uh, fast track uh, time frame. Um, there's a, this entity, uh, which is a federal entity, uh, needs to be established first, so we'll see how long that takes. Uh, I'm sure it'll take some time. Um, but once the entity is created and the, and the commissioners or, or uh, board members are established, um, they are obligated to consult with regional, state, and tribal jurisdictions uh, regarding development of the network, including uh, placement of towers and other infrastructure and coverage areas of that network. Um, uh, it, one of the other critical aspects, I think, for us, for this industry, is that FirstNet, in carrying out these obligations under this provision, uh, must utilize to the maximum extent economically desirable existing commercial or other commercial uh, communications infrastructure, um, as well as federal, state, tribal, or local infrastructure. So for those commercial wireless infrastructure companies, um, here's an opportunity. It's something you're really going to want to uh, pay close attention to. And how uh, DAS uh, facilities and small cell uh, facilities um, interact or may be affected by this uh, first net network um, is something that we'll need to follow closely. Um, I think, it, again, it provides some uh, significant opportunities um, uh, as well that um, will unfold in the near future. That's it for now. Great. Thank you, Doug. Um, I should have mentioned at the top, uh, there will be time uh, reserved for questions. So as you think of uh, questions, jot them down. We'll, we'll be taking them from the, uh, the center microphone. Um, Christopher, would you like to uh, give your remarks? Great. <clears throat> Zach and, and Doug, thank you very much. Is this uh, sound OK? Great. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, emphasize some of the best practices at the state level. So somewhat in an inverted pyramid, Doug talked about some of the recent, and, and Mike as well, uh, some recent developments at the federal level. I'd like to talk about some of the best practices at the legislative level in three states. My primary role uh, within NextG and now uh, proudly with Crown Council is the municipal interface. So to understand the regulatory and legislative environments in order to be able to construct and deliver the networks on behalf of our operator clientele. And I want to just talk uh, briefly about three, three, three structures in, in various states that, that are designed to enable and encourage uh, broadband deployment, um, emerging technologies, uh, infrastructure development, and so forth. The first is here in the state of Georgia. In, in about uh, 2008, uh, the state legislature passed uh, what is now termed Code Section 46-5-1, which effectively preempts uh, state, uh, excuse me, municipal and county governments from requiring individual franchises, right-of-way agreements, licenses, and so forth. They backfilled that space with what would be termed a registration type uh, application. Basically, um, some general contact information, description of services, description of, of service area, a certificate of insurance, and so forth. There is a 60-day clock, um, and if the municipality does not otherwise authorize and grant that application, it is deemed effective by, by default. 
Interestingly, there is a requirement that the municipality must um, affirm whether the application is complete uh, within 30 days, uh, within 15 days, excuse me. The, the process works fairly well. Um, the, the state is in the process of a five-year transition, so any existing franchise or equivalent agreements that are set to expire uh, automatically, uh, this process then would, uh, would be substituted. Any existing franchise um, not otherwise expiring by the end of this year um, would, would be canceled. So um, we have uh, enjoyed um, very good experience with this process. Um, it is still somewhat new. Some of the municipalities don't receive a lot of inquiry um, for this, so there is a lot, lot of education that is required. And I think you'll find that that will be a theme of this panel this morning. Interestingly, on the county side, the county cannot require anything uh, just straight permitting and at the, at the county level they cannot require fees other than a direct administrative recoup recoupment fee um, but if there is no physical impact to the public right-of-way or impairment of the right-of-way there are no permitting fees as well. So again uh, we have a number of, um, of networks here in the state of Georgia and that has worked, uh, worked very well. Again with the intent of streamlining uh, the authorization of access to the public right-of-way uh, next G, uh, now Crown Castle, um, although we do have certain venue uh, networks, we have uh, largely concentrated on outdoor DAS solely deployed within the public rights of way. The second is in the, st is in the state of Florida. Uh, again, in 2002, uh, the state preempted uh, jurisdictions from requiring individual agreements. They backfilled that with, which, with what is called the Communication Services Statute, or those taking notes, it's uh, Statute 337-401. Um, uh, um, they essentially backfilled that with a, a statute and, and a model ordinance, which basically uh, governs the same terms and conditions um, that are otherwise addressed in a conventional or traditional uh, franchise or right-of-way use agreement. Um, there is an application process. There, there are certain elements that are required in the application, such as general contact information, a certificate of insurance, federal and or state uh, certification, uh, a security fund, which is either a letter of credit or, or a bond. Um, and the, the, the model statute, which does which can be modeled, uh, excuse me, can be tailored at the, at the local level, it maintains a fairly high degree of consistency. It does address uh, certain expectations and responsibilities for constructing, placing, and maintaining facilities in the public rights of way. Of interest is, is that in the, in, the, in the model ordinance and to a high degree adopted at the local level, antenna is included in the definition of communications facility. So, going forward and introducing DAS to a municipality or county that is otherwise unfamiliar with the technology, that, that is a, a safe harbor in order to be able to facilitate uh, this, this kind of deployment. Um, we have quite a bit of experience with, uh, with municipalities and counties in Florida, and the process works, works fairly well. Interestingly enough, um, back in 2002, not every municipality or county adopted a local ordinance. So in that case, we would then uh, proceed directly to permitting. We have found that there are some issues in that latter example that otherwise would be captured in the application process, um, and so we've just recalibrated our, our uh, coordination with, with, those, uh, with those jurisdictions accordingly. Um, in terms of compensation, and I should have addressed this in, in the state of Georgia, um, under, in the state of Georgia, it's a 3% adjusted, essentially a franchise fee for adjusted gross revenues. In the state of Florida, every jurisdiction must report to the uh, Florida Department of Revenue a stated uh, percentage of gross revenues, um, and they can change that uh, every January. So it works the same as if it were a franchise agreement. Again, it lowers the, the, the barrier to entry, and it does facilitate uh, rapid investment and deployment within the public rights of way. W there have been occasions where the municipality has been unfamiliar with its own ordinance, and through recent turnover of personnel, that process for matriculating uh, a, a registration application has been lost. So 
again, a lot of education with, uh, with our municipal or jurisdictional counterparts does help to, uh, to facilitate an outcome. In those, in those two instances, the end result is simply a letter affirming um, either application acceptance or registration effectiveness. In the third example, it's in the state of Michigan. Um, again, in 2002, in order to, to streamline the authorization uh, of access to the public rights of way to encourage uh, infrastructure investment, um, particularly in the, in, given the state's economic uh, woes, um, they, they approach it somewhat differently. As opposed to um, Georgia and Florida, which, which effectively preempted local jurisdictions from requiring individual, uh, individual agreements, in the state of Michigan, it's a model agreement and a model application form. So there's a very, very high degree of consistency. Um, the application form is quite detailed. Um, there is an application fee. Uh, there is a 45-day clock. Um, again, with some degree of patience, considering that uh, there have been some very significant personnel reductions in, in uh, municipal governments in Michigan. The agreement is, is largely a template form. Um, there's very little modification. Um, and through the repetitive um, uh, administration of that by various uh, telecommunication service providers, um, it does go through uh, channels fairly well. The end result there is, a, is actually an agreement. It's termed a permit agreement, which can be a little confusing because the uh, permits are still required, um, but it does, uh, as opposed to the first two examples, which are uh, typically administrative approvals, um, in the state of Michigan, a Metro Act agreement typically goes through either the city, a council, or a township form of, of government. There, the, the, the due compensation for use of the public right-of-way in Michigan is, a, is typically 5%. Part of the Public Act of uh, 48 in creating a metro authority, they essentially issue invoices against your use of the public right of way, then collect the monies and then distribute that down to the to the local level. It does work well, and we've had very few problems. Um, the municipalities in which we have deployed in Michigan um, are very appreciative. I, we may be the only ones investing and actually deploying uh, new technologies, and so it's been a very good working relationship. Um, uh, there. So um, one of the common themes today is, is speed to market and where do the operators, where, how can we position ourselves in order to facilitate uh, operators success um, and in, in, in turn enhance the user's overall experience. We have found that in these states we tend to earn those projects more so than others, and that often leads to repeat business. So um, to commend those states on addressing those issues, lowering the overall roadblocks to, to um, access to the public right of way in order to be able to facilitate uh, broadband deployment, outdoor deaths, and so forth, it, it has worked very well. Th those, are, those are just uh, three quick case studies on, on, at the state level. Thank you, Christopher. Um, so I think what we've we've seen, uh, you know, we've seen some trends emerging of, um, you know, the the need and want for for broadband and data access, as we've seen from the, the hockey stick graphs of, of data use, and um, has really created a, a landscape where the federal government, as Doug has mentioned, is looking to um, increase the use of existing facilities and, and get. Um, wireless broadband into uh, federal lands and buildings, um, and some states are doing it as well in local counties. Um, my, my question, uh, just a general question for, for you both is, um, you know, we, we've seen unparalleled growth of, of broadband uh, data. Um, it, are the laws, you know, are they keeping pace? Or do they understand the technology well enough in, in some of these areas to, to get it right? So, so Doug, with, with the with the GSA type agreement, what um, what does the GSA have to know and understand to make sure that this is a future-looking sort of master contract? Um, I think it's up to us to educate. Uh, that is the industry. So I think they've got to understand, um, uh, for example, um, on outdoor DAS, initially, you know, what does it mean? What's an installation look like? What are the impacts on, on the properties or buildings that uh, facilities will be constructed? 
Um, and uh, the, the key is really, uh, as you've highlighted, educating. Um, and uh, whether the GSA will be interested in having uh, a fulsome uh, education uh, sessions is a, is a question. Um, we just don't know. We haven't seen it yet. Um, but there's still hope uh, from my perspective. Great. And, and Christopher, I, I think, um, you know, when, when next year Crown Castle uh, is looking to, to put a bid in uh, for a system in, in one of these jurisdictions, um, you know, you, mu you must have mapped out which, which uh, communities are more friendly to DAS and can get a better return on investment. How, how does that look? Like, um, I guess you've, you've had experiences where um, you're known to the jurisdiction and that has a relationship, but um, I guess more of the process of when you have two different jurisdictions in front of you, one's 3%, one's 5%, but you know the process is easier in another. How does that go into the analysis of whether you, do, you work to deploy there? Well, actually, when opportunities present themselves, it's typically in the form of a, of a polygon or multiple polygons. And so that we would then cross-reference the underlying jurisdictions and then begin to engage those municipalities. Um, typically, it's, it's more of a, at first, it's, it may be an informational inquiry as to what their process or processes might be. That would then typically be followed up by a formal application. Um, and included in that application would be some informational uh, materials to debrief them on who we are, what we do, what we hope to ultimately achieve. Um, perhaps uh, some representative uh, photos of various installations, uh, our past uh, experiences perhaps in, within the metro area or elsewhere, to give them a sense as to what we ultimately uh, endeavor to do. Um, in terms of comparing franchisees uh, against one or the other, we would certainly try to understand whether that whether those fees um, or ordinances would apply to us. But at times, that's that may be just the cost of doing business. But what we want to highlight is some of the ordinances or some of the uh, institutional roadblocks that that may present themselves. Um, some of the issues um, that we've encountered. Um, your, your question about ordinances. Ordinances typically lag. Um, there, there are occasions where they do anticipate, um, and I highlighted one where, where antennas were included in the, the definition of communication facilities in the state of Florida. But in terms of DAS, um, most municipal or county ordinances are generally silent. So sometimes that works to our favor, sometimes it does not. Um, that, that, that's an invitation for consultation and, and coordination with our municipal counterparts in order to, to brief them. They're going to receive the calls for these installations in the public rights of way. So to the extent that they are briefed and knowledgeable about what has been installed and some of the, the legal or circumstantial underpinnings uh, in terms of the, the approval and or permitting process, the better for the overall deployment. And do we have any questions from the audience? Um, if you do, please make your way to the microphone. And we'll be happy to take it. Is Tracy paying ten dollars again it, for each question? I think it's up to twenty. No, no it's postage is deducted from it. Um, I, I do. I do have another question. I, it kind of goes along with. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, my, my best guess is what, there, there isn't directly, um, but my best guess is the, uh, the right-of-way and easement provisions are intended to apply on pricing as well uh, for, for the master contracts for all, you know, whether it's a, an easement or a lease. But it's not clear, uh, so we'll have to figure that one out. Yeah, it's a great question, um, and you're right. There have been uh, initiatives in the past for quite some time um, that have not been as successful, I guess, from our perspective. Um, 
but uh, the, the one difference is that the mandate's coming down from Congress and the President, um, and it dovetails with the broadband uh, uh, plan uh, that was uh, issued a couple of years ago. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm optimistic um, that there will be a change. Um, frankly, it, they, they've, they've put the responsibility on the, the uh, GSA, which is probably the right way to go. But as we all know, the federal government is a massive bureaucracy. And for um, something like that to filter down to the various agencies is going to take some time. So um, I would think uh, so long as the congressional and presidential mandates are that we need to make this happen and we've got to expand broadband in this country, um, it, it will happen. But I, but I don't think it's going to happen overnight. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I will tell you that it, um, we're on the verge of having an uh, uh, having an answer to the question. Um, it's just, you know, I think um, our clients have been very careful about making sure that they uh, uh, determine what the right uh, sites are, what the right scenarios are uh, to uh, approach municipalities that may have a different perspective. So uh, nothing yet, no, no real uh, experience yet. We have. Thank you. Great. Uh, I had a question that came out of sort of the theme yesterday. We, we, we heard a lot of uh, talk about expectations of, of wireless and, and data use. Um, and, and I was wondering um, something uh, that came to me. So oftentimes DAS is deployed in a high concentrated area. Um, but what about, what about folks in rural areas? I know the FCC is very interested in in getting broadband access out to those rural areas, um, and say a rural area has the greatest ordinance in the world, and uh, you know we've heard rumors that you know iPhone and the iPhone and other devices may be coming to rural carriers and whatnot, um, and they want a DAS. You know they don't they, they think it you know looks beautiful and it's it's got all these great benefits and they can uh, you know work on the road, um, but the town's you know 2,000 people. Um, how how do you I mean. Maybe Christopher, you might have an answer to that. Do, do, do people, have they started knocking on your door for a DAS system, uh, outdoor DAS? Not to my experience, no. Uh, we spend most of our emphasis in the urban and suburban areas. Uh, certainly DAS uh, would be uh, a suitable form of deployment in just about any environment. Um, but I'm not aware that uh, with it within my experience at NextG um, that we have deployed in any rural environment. Um, but a, a, a similar theme, Zach, is that uh, in the early days of outdoor desk, we were focused more on coverage issues, uh, if you will, the, 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 the proverbial drop zone. And that has shifted more towards capacity solutions. So getting back into the, the local environment, um, we find ourselves designing networks that are that are encroaching further and further within residential neighborhoods um, in order to highlight those, those aggregations of, of subscribers, of users who are trying to access the network simultaneously. Typically large apartment complexes, uh, residential communities, uh, university centers, and so forth. That's leading to um, some different level of engagement, shall we say, with, with the municipality. Um, I think there's some general tolerance about deploying along major thoroughfares and in commercial and industrial areas, but uh, obviously there is a, there's a heightened sensitivity in residential neighborhoods. So that, that's, current, that's a, a, a current um, uh, development that we're 
that we're currently experiencing. But on the on the rural level, we certainly welcome those opportunities. But uh, the operators have not uh, have not expressed that uh, thus far. Um, I guess another theme we, we've discussed is, is education, and this question is for, for both of you. Um, how, how can we do a better job of educating municipalities and, and governments about the, the laws as they stand and help them to understand a, a future-looking ordinance and how that can, that can help uh, you know, you know, business and uh, personal use of, of these uh, services? Uh, I will say it's probably a multi-pronged approach. Um, and I would take advantage of the, uh, the good work, actually the great work that you've done at PCIA and the DAS Forum with respect to the federal legislation. Um, and in particular, for example, the uh, DAS Day in, uh, in Washington held a couple of months ago. Um, I think the FCC in particular, uh, based on that uh, uh, day, uh, was very interested in trying to help with education of uh, local and state government officials. I think that's part of it. There's also got to be um, sort of uh, grassroots education at the at the local level, where you know where there's difficulty at the local level. Um, but uh, it's it's not an easy task. But I think it's got to be both you know high level, if you will, uh, probably from the federal side as well as local. And, and I would echo that as well. I, I, education is is certainly key. Um, Sometimes it just comes down to, to, to trying to assist a municipal or jurisdictional counterpart as to where this type of development would fit in within their, their code of ordinances. Um, not, not all of the right-of-way is zoned. Not every utility, and NextG historically has operated as a, as a utility, um, not every utility installation necessarily must be, must be zoned. Uh, we do take a very hard line against zoning or discretionary approval for our installations. Um, but that, that often results in uh, just meeting with various representatives of the jurisdiction to, um, to outline our, our plan and, and, our, um, and our arguments against those, those kinds of, uh, of regulation. And we've been very successful in that. Um, but I, I certainly echo uh, Doug's statements about PCIA taking the charge and, and leading the advocacy effort and, and model ordinances and, and so forth. Um, sometimes uh, the, the jurisdictions tend to be process oriented and if, if the ordinance does not specifically state then there's a, a, an inclination that that, that sort of uh, uh, facility or, or endeavor might otherwise be prohibited and it just takes a little bit more a little bit more persuasion, a little bit more coordination and, and, and consultation in order to make that work. But that, that's, that, that gets back to the, the earlier question, Zach, about those, those jurisdictions which may be friendly or, 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 or more unfriendly to this type of, of, uh, of installation. And it's just trying to identify those and, and work with them. And in most cases, in the vast majority, we, we, can, we can work it out uh, without having to, to escalate the matter. Great. Th thank you both uh, for, for your comments, and uh, I think we've hit our, our stop line. Um, so, so thank you for your questions. We have a number of panels coming up. Uh, so join me in uh, thanking the panel. and. Uh